Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Always excited to have a return engagement. And we have someone who was on the show back in the fall of 2020, which is a, a heady time for us to think back on. And at the time, he was talking about a book that he was working on. I now can hold the book in my hands. I just finished reading it. It's called Make to Know. Lauren Buckman is back with us. Lauren is the president of the Arts Center College of Design in Pasadena. He's also the host of a podcast called Change Lab. Really enjoyed our first run at this when Lauren was, was first on the show, and I'm really excited to welcome you back to the show. Lauren, welcome back to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. Delighted to be here. Once the concept of Make to Know settles in, you see it everywhere. I sent you a note when I was watching the, the Get Back documentary with the Beatles where I got very excited because I was like, this is Make to Know. Right. Can you quickly update our, our listeners on, first, just to remind them who you are, how you got to this point in your professional life, if they haven't listened to our first episode, and then we can lean in a little more to talk about Make to Know. Sure. As you mentioned, I'm currently president of Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and I've been here for uh, close to 13 years. In a previous life, was uh, um, president of a couple of other art schools, and then was also on the faculty for 10 years at the University of California, Berkeley, in the theater department. And my background is in theater. I'm a theater director, and uh, at one point focused on Shakespeare, but later got into more contemporary dramatic literature um, and uh, directed a, a lot while I was at at Berkeley and mm -hmm. taught both practical and theoretical courses. So, yeah. and that combination of both the, the practice and the scholarship of the discipline finds its way into the, the curriculum of the, the art design schools that I've had the privilege to, to, to lead. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we first caught up in 2020, we were talking obviously about the pandemic and then the, the uprising and the, the, the awakening around social justice and equity and many of those challenges, which you were grappling with then. And I'm sure you've continued to work through leading the, the art center in Pasadena. And then alongside with that, you've also written this book, which was in many ways a theme to our initial conversation. It does seem like thematically it's consistent with a lot of your experience where you were a director who was making things. From there, you became uh, a, a university president in different capacities, but still held on to that initial uh, creator sensibility. And then what we talked a lot about, you're working in a design school where you're teaching folks how to make things. Throughout that process, there is a tremendous amount of learning and discovery that happens. You have some really interesting thoughts on the creative process, and then you were able to crystallize that into this concept of make to know. And then you went into writing this really interesting book wide cross-section of makers and artists and designers who you interviewed. Can you catch our listeners up a little bit on what Make to Know is and what's in the book? What I love, Mike, or what I find so fascinating is, for example, when a novelist says that, um, that they created the shell of their characters and then the characters told them what they needed to say. Similarly, when Umberto Eco in the postscript to the name of the rose says, I didn't know Jorge was the murderer until I put him in the library. When Alexander Calder, the great artist says, I think in wire. These are all examples to me of uh, a kind of fascination I hold of what the making process reveals in Calder's case with materials, in the case of the writers, the, the process of writing that opens up possibility in the case of Ego and the plot itself, in the case of a novelist talking about the character, somehow there's an engagement, a conversation, a dialogue with a thing being made. And what has captured my imagination really is 
the, the process that creative people go through and then it gets democratized to all of us in a re really interesting way to understand what making reveals. Now this, I would contrast with what I was raised with, and maybe some of your listeners were as well with the notion that, and it, and it is a popular notion that, that surprisingly persists of, uh, Michelangelo seeing the angel on the stone and he chipped away until he set it free, mm -hmm. that there was a vision that the role of the artist or the role of the creative really is to have vision and that the work becomes the manifestation of vision. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be people who work that way, by the way. I'm not interested in making some sort of rigid statement that, that never happens. Mm -hmm. Paul McCartney famously woke up one day and said, I dreamed yesterday, and there it was. You can imagine that there would be some kind of uh, realization of vision. I, and, but most artists and designers that I talk to, as well as my own experience, suggests otherwise. Mm -hmm. That is not really so much a manifestation of vision, that what we have is a question, a notion, a bit of an idea, hmm. an urge. Some poets have called it a stomach ache, something that propels us into a world of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And if we go into that uncertainty, into that world of uncertainty, then we begin to make within it, we begin to engage materials, we begin to solve problems, we begin to improvise and play and understand and go through a process of making that actually opens up, that reveals, that gives us a sense of what the outcome could be, what it might be, mm. how the product might, of our work might take shape. Mm -hmm. We can discover that Jorge was the murderer because we did something along the lines in our making and moving those words around the page mm -hmm. that opened up the possibility of us discovering something essential about the work. Yeah. So that's what interests me. And that's what the make to know concept is really um, fundamentally about what yeah. making reveals and how as creatives, we need to stay open as long as possible to get the recognition and the surprises of what the making process can offer us. Yeah. Yeah. I love that on a number of dimensions as a father of a young child now, a three-year-old, the element of play and discovery that I'm experiencing again, and the level to which children make in some ways, humans are built to play and make things. I was struck by the breadth of the subjects that you engaged with, although to the best of my knowledge, there were no three-year-olds. So maybe that's for the, the next edition, but you did tap into, you were talking to this a little bit, uh, just now you did tap into songwriters and playwrights, screenwriters, visual artists, uh, multimedia artists, uh, you, you pretty much every dimension of, of the creative arts. You also work in a design school, which is coming up with automotive design. And you talked about the, the Tesla model S and what was involved. The breadth was something that really struck me when engaging with the book. Can you talk a bit about your process and the, the range of folks that you, you interviewed as the book was coming together? I was interested in a, a range of disciplines because I wanted to understand, first of all, if there was a kind of common denominator among the, multi, the, the disciplines in terms of this relationship of making and knowing, and if really it was just not a fundamental difference, but only a practical difference really in terms of how the artist or the designer work. But what really came through, and this was my own make to know process of writing the book and interviewing people, what really came through and what I really, I learned was that there's a lot of overlap and a lot of commonalities, but really from writers, I learned about a lot about the blank page and about entering uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And that became something that weaves through the book in really important ways from visual artists of all kinds of of disciplines, I learned about what it means to engage materials and what their experience is and the conversation they have with the materials they use 
Beautiful example being that one of my interviewees said that when she was in a early figure drawing class, her instructor said, here's what you need to be aware of. Think about the conversation that's going on between the charcoal, the piece of paper and you, hmm. and that the charcoal creates some kind of act on the paper. And the paper responds and says, oh, you give me this and I'll give this back to you. And then you begin to see this conversation unfolding. And what I loved about that was the making process defined and the artist engaged and watching and observing and being in a place of responsiveness mm -hmm. to what was happening along the way. From designers, I learned about the lens of problem solving. And how making is this iterative process of problem solving. Mm. That's nothing new in the world of design, but I think what was new was how the making process was defined within the context of design and how that problem solving framework functions to allow for a kind of revelation, a recognition, a surprise that otherwise didn't exist. Mm. And finally from performers and songwriters. Really, it's all it gathers around this notion of improvisation, which is this beautiful way of talking about the make to know process, simply because the process of improvising is identical to what the product is. Process and product are one in improvisation. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of combination is a beautiful illustration of what I mean. So I learned these things from these different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And yet when you really begin to explore it and listen to the reflections of the artists and designers I spoke to, you see wonderful overlap and you see each one of those concepts or each one of those examples of making just be part of really every discipline I looked at. Yeah. And I did find inspiration. You, you mentioned it earlier. It's a democratizing concept. It is a place where I'd say the book is not just for serious artists. I, I think it's for all of us to understand how in our lives and in our professional presence, how we in many ways are making things and we in many ways are engaging in a similar exercise. Many of our listeners are focused as you are on education as their avocation, as the place where they're finding the most meaning and relevance in the, in their professional lives. I know you discussed this in the book and I'm sure it resonates with you as leading your organization through these tumultuous times. Can you talk about how make to know relates outside of the creative arts and how in some ways this process is relevant to, you know, you also mentioned entrepreneurs. I think there's a lot of, uh, range. I think you also mentioned leaders thoughts on where make to know extends beyond the the stricter definition of the creators yeah i the last ch chapter of the book after i've woven my way through these four notions of uncertainty engaging materials problem solving improvisation the last chapter of the book is called implications for how we live and ex does exactly that it treats a variety of different enterprises of the of human experience that relate directly to the make to know idea. And that is, yeah, it's in business, it's in leadership, it's, but it's also, uh, you talk about your young child, it's also about how we learn how to walk and that how we learn how to walk is fundamentally a make to know process for a toddler mm -hmm. uh, as they move in, into places of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of things to contextualize that. One is that when I first talked about the make to know process and listeners may be experiencing this right now, of the scores and even hundreds of conversations I had, not all formal interviews, Nobody ever looked at me quizzically and said, I don't really get what you mean. It was like this intuitive, oh yeah, I know that. And it's mm -hmm. funny artists would say to me, I, that's exactly my experience and I've never named it that. And the more that happened to me, I had a moment of deep worry because I thought, am I saying this guy's blue here? You know what I mean? And really began to study, well, what is the narrative about creativity? And what I come up with is that there's a dominant narrative in Western culture that focuses on a preoccupation with genius with the artist as mad and, or with the artist as divinely inspired, that there are an elect few who are, who channel the gods, the muse. Mm -hmm. 
And this goes back to Homer and the beginning incantation of the Iliad or the Odyssey, right? Mm. And if you really begin to study that, and for folks who are interested in the book, they should sort of re it's really interesting to see how that persists even to the point I want to make in, in, in terms of your question, however, is that we do have, we do have geniuses among us, I think, and mad artists and maybe even people who channel the divine. That's not the point. My point is it's a narrative that has skewed our sense of what creativity is mm. and to your point has limited it to some elect few. So then what happens to the rest of the, of rank and file humanity and where is their creativity and their creative life? And I was certainly raised with the notion and always felt like I, I couldn't be creative. There was no creativity in me because my sense of what I defined as creative, the vocabulary around it was so fundamentally limited. Yeah. But in the spirit of what you're asking, I think we are makers. I think the human capacity to make and making as a way of learning is critical. And I think that's so much of what my, this has taught me. Mm. And so the implications for something like education are enormous. If we shift our thinking for a moment away from making sure our students have X, Y, and Z and fit all the requirements and instead think about them as makers. Mm -hmm and how they may engage in their work, how they may be able to build a, a curriculum, a way of knowing that enables that kind of making sensibility. And there are for sure ideas and there's applied ways of, and theories of education that certainly make use of this. Yeah. But I think that needs to take hold of us a little bit more so that we can honor the human capacity to make and to know through that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The education that we build. Yeah. Related concepts that come up frequently on this show, the idea of growth mindset and the imposter syndrome, the idea that you were even mentioning it earlier, you're now uh, an established scholar and written books and directed many plays and now you're leading the art center, but you did experience that sense of artists are not like me, or I am not of that genius type. Do you see parallels there? Are there ways in which we need to get beyond maybe more limited conceptions of ourselves and engage in that uncertainty and that stomach ache you were referring to this, this sense of, I am less than I want to be. So that through the process of then engaging with that, going through that discomfort, the old gym metaphor, pain is weakness, leaving the body. You have to go through that discomfort to truly achieve something meaningful on the other side. You, you, thoughts on the imposter syndrome, growth mindset. So here's how I make sense of this. We get a little bit binary when we think about who's creative and who's not. And, and it's been, one of the interesting experiences as I wrote this book and as I interviewed people, on occasion, the idea of make to know would be misinterpreted as um, making it up as you go along or building the plane as you fly. And it has absolutely nothing to do with that. That is a complete misconception because I actually believe that we have our education, our experience, our skill base, our priorities, our ethics, our overall commitments to human thriving, whatever it might be, th those elements are essential to anything that we do and to the, and to the creative life. So the Gladwell 10,000 hours becomes significant here. We do need that. We do need the skill, but the misunderstanding is that's the scaffolding that pr provides us with what the scaffold that, that we stand on, but as we reach into uncertainty, but reach into uncertainty, we do. Mm -hmm. And so then you begin to imagine the supremely talented individual has a scaffolding that they can stand on that may be different from somebody who has a different talent ability. But it doesn't become about that. It be, that, that becomes a kind of structure that is used, a way to support. But the courage to go into these places of the unknown and to really discover and to bring life to a work because that discovery process is happening is the essential element here. Mm 
-hmm. Now, somebody with less experience or an amateur or somebody who is just beginning to learn or beginning. So the scaffolding is different and it doesn't allow them to reach as high that they may not feel as comfortable or as courageous to enter this place of uncertainty, but they build that skill over time. That's the business I'm in, in educating artists and designers mm -hmm. to help with the skill and the courage and the experience and the sense of self that allows them to reach into these places of uncertainty and discover. Mm -hmm. And it's important to stress actually that so much of the motivation to write this book was for my students. Mm -hmm. So I witnessed stuck because they didn't feel like they had it all figured out beforehand. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that vision because they're stuck in that old idea that you need to know it all, you, that the work of the artist or designer is manifesting an already preconceived vision or idea, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to allowing themselves to ride on that question, that notion, that idea, that brief, that will bring them into a place of uncertainty. The more work they do, the more experience they have, the more strength, the more, the higher they can reach. And they can go into these places of the unknown and begin to discover something that could never have been imagined mm -hmm. beforehand. Yeah. To me, that resonates with the, the idea of getting comfortable with discomfort, seeking out that level of desirable difficulty is the, is the learning. Right. Right. And the I, thing about uncertainty is let's be clear. Uncertainty is destabilizing. It's frightening. It's a difficult place, but it's also a deeply creative place. Mm. And that's the point. Yeah. And if we're willing to go in and then again, something like our education or our skill, our experience, whatever it is, helps us have the, the boldness, the courage to go into that difficult place, mm. but without going in the discovery can't happen with the same power or the same possibility. Yeah. And I do think the examples that play out in the book signal to us that even the, these established artists are operating in a very similar, uncertain way. And in some ways they need to continue to challenge themselves through some process of reinvention and leading in through new entry points into new frames of uncertainty that in some ways the process really never ends for us. And right. the other dimension that I wanted to bring in is this particular moment in time is more uncertain than perhaps any other that I've experienced in my several years upon the planet. Are there rays of hope in these difficult times where in some ways there's more uncertainty, there's more emotional upheaval that is causing that itch among many of us to express ourselves and to lean into creative expression. Do you have any reflections on the, the crucible in which we're living these days? And in some ways, I think it makes your book even more relevant, but any perspective on the, the challenges we're facing and how that relates to Make to Know? I think if we begin to see uncertainty as a creative space and not just as a kind of threatening, a destabilizing space. I think that it really is the way to begin a response to your question. It's such a good question. How do we see this moment as a way to gather up our values, our principles, our thoughts, our beliefs, and use it as a scaffolding to support us as we explore this new world mm. and amazing things happen in that world. And I think of the novelist, Amy Tan, who, you know, she, who's in the book and she talks about how she uses quantum physics to describe it, which she says she knows nothing about, but she uses it anyway. And you begin to think about that space of uncertainty and it's gravitational pulls and it's black holes and it's, it's explosions and it's particles and all the various different dimensions of it and how you begin to engage and negotiate that. Well, here we have a kind of opportunity at this moment, mm -hmm. to be able to explore, to discover, to remain open to what we deliberately don't want to know. It's Sam Hamilton, the great artist, Sam Hamilton talking about, we need to actually cultivate a place of not knowing so that we can 
exercise a discipline, and maybe that's another way to talk about this moment too, exercise a discipline to stay open to our creative engagement with this place of uncertainty. And it's interesting, it's not a passive thing. It's a, it's an active making. And that's another subtle, but really important distinction. It's not like we're just, okay, tell me universe or let me know. I am a creative, I am engaged creatively. Mm -hmm. And it brings me to a kind of link. You said it touches on everything, but it also touches on our spiritual lives and what it means to engage with the uncertainty of the world and what it means to pray as an improvisation and what it means to discover who we are in a kind of making in relationship to something larger than ourselves too. So there are so many ways in which I think this becomes incredibly important. I think the other thing that I would say too, that I learned about, about the, well, a couple of things I would say. One is that designers in particular teach me that constraints, which we tend to think about as limiting our, our options actually paradoxically open possibility and designers look for those constraints as a way to help shape what it is they do. Mm. And improvisation becomes important here too. Improvisation doesn't happen out of nowhere as from reading the book. Improvisation happens within some kind of frame. You need that frame. Mm. If we begin to think about our lives, the way we educate people, the way we build businesses, the way we create things in terms of not so much a rigid layering of things, but as open frames where the breeze can blow a little bit and understand yeah. that we engage within that context and we begin to discover what that is and maybe even build and create beyond the perimeters of what that frame allows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those kinds of ways of thinking about constraints and frames, I think are important and uh, a really significant way in which we can think about this moment too. What is the frame we have? What are we creating within it? Yeah. How do we move forward? How do we leave ourselves open? Discipline in, in I think, Buddhist teaching of the not knowing mind right. and what it might bring. Mm -hmm. I remember in our first conversation, we were making some connections between your experience as a director and your experience as uh, a leader of a university, a leader of art center. Are there ways in which make to know has helped you in your role as the president of, of the art center college of design? It's who I am. I'm for sure in so many aspects of my life, a make to know person. And I would say that's true as a theater director. I would say that was true as a, as a writer, for sure. And I'm quite like the great like. Joan Didion, who said, I, I have, would have no reason to write if I could access my thoughts in any other way. That's perfect make to know. You, mm -hmm. you need to do the writing to, in, in this case, to know how she thinks, to know the self, mm -hmm. which is an enormously important dimension in all of this as well. Yeah. And for me, the leadership piece is, uh, is illustrated best by a, a story I tell in the book about this, uh, this event in Northern Holland, in which there was this intersection in the city in Northern Holland, there was a very dangerous intersection and there were a lot of cars that were crashing. There were pedestrians being knocked over. There were bicyclists being injured. And the more accidents happened, the more the authorities would put up signs and say, don't go here and slow down here and, and really try to control the environment as much as possible. And the, the more they did that, the worse it got. Uh, a very creative and interesting traffic designer, a guy by the name of Hans Monderman. And this is almost 20 years ago now. I discovered this about 15 years ago and I was blown away. Hans Monderman came along and he had a very different philosophy and very different approach. And he was actually inspired by watching how people operate on a crowded skating rink and that they actually watch out for each other in an interesting way. And there's a few idiots who cause commotion, but the basic human instinct is that they, they, they move together in interesting ways. And you can think about that in nature too, with a mm -hmm. flock of birds or a school of fish. Mm -hmm. And what he wanted to do was rather than create this kind of authoritarian imposition on the situation to remove the restrictions and open it up possibility. And so he created a roundabout. And then he talked about what happens in the experience of cars that are approaching this roundabout. And he talks about in the language of uncertainty that you're not exactly sure where you're going mm. and you naturally slow down. And the moment he created this roundabout, people began to take care of themselves. Mm. 
cars slow down, they yielded to each other. They like on that crowded skating rink that it, it drew upon that instinct, what was best in them to work together with them. Mm. Crashes stopped, pedestrians were safe, bicyclists weren't injured. It's a beautiful story. And so what, why it's so important to, as a metaphor of leadership to me is I think if we can create the roundabouts in the places we lead, what it allows for is that is a community to take ownership in this case, in Monerman's case, they took ownership of their own safety. It wasn't opposed from externally. They experienced it. They engaged it. They were makers of what needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And so you begin to think about leadership as enabling a kind of making, mm. even if it means people have to go into a place of uncertainty, because think about it. I was saying uncertainty is a scary place before without those signs telling you what to do, it can become potentially become scarier, mm. but something else happened and a problem was solved. And I think a follow the leader metaphor. Come with me, follow me. I know the answers. I know what to do. I'm the authoritarian voice. Mm -hmm. It's a very different kind of leadership than I am someone who is working with the community to create a structure for human thriving, human safety, human growth. And I think that's, for me, what my experience has been as a college president. It's been really trying to work with communities to build the roundabouts that allow them to thrive, that allow the most important moment in the experience of the college, a kind of learning moment can happen mm -hmm. without authoritarian signs of saying, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. I have the answer to it. Yeah. That's great stuff. It immediately made me think of the teaching process as well, where the sage on the stage, the imparting of knowledge, the pouring of information into your subject's brains is very much a an old notion or evolving into this notion of co-creation and learning as much from your students as you are imparting knowledge to them. I was also thinking about implications to product development and design thinking and how we think about designing for humans who are engaging with technology. It's almost a similar notion where if the technology is challenging you and allowing you to co-create and find meaning and make meaning, that's one thing. But if instead we're ceding our authority to the technology solution, and it, it is a threatening time in that respect too, where what it means to be human and how do we retain the role of our humanity in the future of work is something we talk about quite a bit on the show. There's so many directions we can go, Lauren. I know we only have a little bit more of your time. Before we get to any closing thoughts, because I have a feeling you have some wonderful gems to impart on your way out, I want to hear what you're working on next, because if I just get in my time travel machine and I come back a year and a half and suddenly I have a book in my hands, what's next for you? There are, there are a few things. I'll, I'll tell you that I've been thinking a lot about a documentary based on Make to Know mm -hmm. and what it would be like to actually see this live. Mm. And you alluded earlier to the Beatles get back and what it was to watch Paul McCartney begin to improvise the song, get back yeah. before our eyes yeah. and how incredible and, and energizing it is to see in this case, a genius for sure, but nonetheless, that, that genius was in a make to know process. Mm -hmm. Or the repetition of the let it be, as he was on the piano there, playing that let it be over and over again. I think Ringo starts, I could just watch and play piano all day long. Yeah. There's something so energizing and wonderful and enlivening about that. Mm -hmm. And so I called Paul and asked him if he wanted, no, I'm kidding. Uh, and it, it, I, so I would like to do that, that. There's a documentary I would like to sure. explore doing based on Make to Know. I do think I have another book in me. I think it's related to Make to Know in certain ways, but it goes into ways of, of exploring how really certain books, certain plays, certain films have explored the idea and treated it not quite so literally but how there's a kind of ambiguity of human experience that's at play in all of this that interests me so much. 
as opposed to the kind of binary black and white thinking that we get today so much. If all the great works and great influences and great teaching of my life have fundamentally pointed out the ambiguity of human experience, then how do we deal with that politician banging the table saying, this is the way it is. We know that's not the way it is. And as a leader of an institution, I can tell you that one of my deepest struggles has been that I recognize and I've learned and I've been trained to recognize the ambiguity of human experience, but you can't hover in ambiguity as a leader. Mm -hmm. You do need to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so the, a really interesting question and make to know is relevant as we discussed a little earlier, how does one make decision amidst ambiguity? Mm -hmm. Huge question, really interesting mm -hmm. and something that I've really tried to dealt with and struggled with uh, yeah. for, for um, a lot of my professional life and personal life too. So anyway, those are some, yep. so I, I want to do some writing about that. I, mm -hmm. I, there, I think there's a lot of richness in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Your book was certainly an inspiration for me. I think it would be also for our listeners as we're wrapping up, Lauren, any parting thoughts? What's your third appearance on trending in education? You qualify for a refrigerator magnet. So I, <laughs> there is uh, hopefully a, a return engagement in your future. But as you head off back to all of your endeavors, any concluding thoughts for our listeners as we bring this conversation to, to its conclusion? I, I will return to what I mentioned earlier, that if we can honor our capacity as makers in all facets of our life, I think the possibilities for human flourishing are, are endless. And when we get too preoccupied with, we have a vision for our lives, how many people do we know who, who are stuck because not everything is in place for that vision to be realized. And in one way we need to certainly build the scaffolding. We need to build the experience. We need those 10,000 hours. We need the education. All of that is incredibly important. But at the end of the day, we need to brave uncertainty and understand that we make our lives. And that's the richest experience in a way that we can have versus having a preconceived vision of our lives that we rigidly stick to. So that's just another way to think about you know, how we live. Yeah. Wonderful stuff. Lauren Buckman is the president of the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. He's the author of a really interesting book, Make to Know. We'll be including that in the show notes for this episode. Lauren, thanks so much for rejoining us here on Trending in Education. Thank you, Mike. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thanks. And for our listeners, hopefully you enjoy what you're hearing. If you do, write us a review, share the good word with your network. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.